Our reading this morning is taken from Matthew 14. It's the New Testament reading and we read from verse 13 to 21. Hear the word. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a lonely place apart. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. As he went ashore, he saw a great throng, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a lonely place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away and go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, We have only five loaves here and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed, and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied, and they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. Here ends our reading today. We thank and praise the Lord for his word. Good morning, Stella Bosch. I am recording this in the buildings of Somerset West again. And once again, with the wonderful help from Sasha Marchinkowski, and I'm deeply grateful for that. It's actually Tuesday, um, and we're in the middle of taxis and taxi wars. I had to go earlier this morning to collect some staff for the complex I live in. Um, I live in Durbanville, and the, the staff lives in Bluekombos. And when I picked them up, uh, I was told that already two cars and a bucky had been torched doing exactly what I was doing, picking up people um, to give them lifts. So we're in a horrible time. I hope by the time we all hear this on Sunday, things are much calmer and the city's back to normal. As we come to the scriptures today, um, the reading and the preaching of God's word, I hope you will learn nothing new today. Quite seriously, I just hope that everything I say will just be like an underline of something that you that you know and uh, and know and know really well. Whenever we read the Bible, whatever passage out of anywhere in the sixty-six books, uh, the first question that we really should be asking is, what does this teach us about God? If I read a passage, what does this teach me about God? So often we rush to thinking what's the message for me what am i supposed to be doing and often us ministers push you down that line um i I remember being taught um, by one of my mentors preach for a verdict make them make a decision to do something Uh, and in fact the real thing to do is to say what does this teach us about god so the scriptures open in the beginning god And at the end of the scriptures, the book of Revelation, I mean, what is the book about? We're told in the first line, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's about him. So from beginning to end. So the passage from uh, Matthew 14 that we've heard read to us about the feeding of the 5,000. If I asked you, what is it about? Well, you'd better say it's about God rather than about something we should be, we should be doing. His person, his work, about our Father, about Christ Jesus, and about the Spirit. What's the context? <clears throat> Jesus has sent the twelve out on their first mission, and they have uh, come back, having been given authority to preach and authority over demons and authority to heal. Uh, they come back full of excitement and joy, sort of bubbling over with what they've seen and heard, and they want to tell Jesus. At the same time, however, Herod has arrested. John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, for uh, some straightforward comments Jesus has made about Herod's sexuality and abuse of power, and in a sordid and disgusting display of power to please uh, capricious guests, uh, Herod has John beheaded. Now, let's just be clear about this, that the scriptures tell us in, in Hebrews 11 that many of our ancestors Uh, under persecution, had horrible, horrible deaths, so don't get dramatic about this. Jesus is devastated. It's his cousin. He is sad. He is sad, 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 and he wants to go, we're told, to a solitary place 
to a lonely place out of the public eye. I think two things are happening in the Lord Jesus here. I think he really is moved by the death of his cousin. And I think he's also moved by the joy in the 12 and what's happened to them. But he wants just to get himself and them out of the public eye and to, and to hunker down together and to share both sadnesses and joys. So that's all in verse 13 of this chapter, the first one we've looked at. So what does it teach us about God, this first verse in our study today? Simply, God is moved by our sadnesses and he's moved by our joy and successes. God is moved by what's happening to us, whether it's on a high or a low, a joy or our sadness. I could say that this first verse, verse 13, um, tells us that when we grieve, we should go into a lonely place with the Lord Jesus, a quiet place. I could say that when we've done outstandingly well and we're proud of something and we're full of excitement, that really a good spiritual response is also to go to a quiet place with the Lord Jesus and to tell him how we feel and to feel and to get his confirmation and his affirmation. But you can see how quickly I would have moved from what's this about God to what I should be, should be doing. So let's just stick with this. He is affected. He's moved deeply by what we're going through. And he's interested. He's interested in what's happening to us. He's not distant. He is here. There's a, there's a pulpit fall, a pulpit hanging in a church in Durbanville, in the Dutch Reformed Church in Durbanville that says, Yes, us is here but in English that reads Jesus is here and a bunch of Americans uh, visiting the church saw this Jesus is here and they said gee how cool that you should say Jesus is here but in fact that's really the gospel he has come to us he is here with us he is interested in us and and he's moved so Hebrews 4 verse 15 says we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our sadnesses, that he was tempted like us in every way, including feeling God's absent, God's not there, our Father doesn't care. So, whether you're at home or in church with us today, however you got up, however you felt when you got up, however you came to worship, whatever you were feeling as you got out of your car, whatever this week has been, and it's not been a great week for many of us, Jesus, our Lord, is interested to hear how we're feeling, to listen to us, to weep with us, to laugh with us. Now, if you can't work that out from verse 13, then certainly verse 14 must make it abundantly clear. Verse 14 tells us, when he saw the crowd, he had compassion on them and healed them because they looked like sheep without a shepherd. Sheep without a shepherd. <laughs> a fairly chaotic bunch. I remember being surrounded by, by sheep driving on my brother, brother-in-law's uh, sheep farm in, in the Greater Craddock area. And he was delivering salt licks out in the felt. Uh, and somehow the shepherd boy had disappeared and we were literally surrounded. The bucky was absolutely hemmed in by sheep. And, and they were all looking as dumb as ever, and you were just hoping someone would come and rescue the sheep and rescue, and rescue us. So, all these words and expressions come to mind when we think of sheep without a shepherd. Muda Lewis, despondent, being sorry for yourself, depressed, confused, worried, restless, anxious, seeing ghosts that don't actually exist, believing a lie about yourself or about others or about God nail biting, foot tapping, leg shaking with irritability and agitation, feeling left out the FOMO, you know, fear of missing out, feeling forgotten, feeling rejected, dejected, in debt up to your eyeballs, thinking how do I ever cope with my teenagers, being on nursel, just feeling fraught. All, all these sum up what it is to be like sheep without a shepherd. We've all been there. Some have made their home in that place and they're constantly uh, attacked by by the evil one and circumstances around them but our darling jesus feels what we feel he knows that we sheep without a shepherd so throughout the bible 
the primary image of the king of God is, is the shepherd king. The shepherd king. So we sing sometimes, the king of love, my shepherd is, his goodness faileth never. Jesus is called the good shepherd. He's called the great shepherd. He's called the chief shepherd. And of course, we do sing the Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. So slow down. Slow down and go into a quiet place and be with him. Whether it's a joy you want to share, a real, this has been lovely, Lord, thank you. Or whether it's, this has just been a terrible week and I'm feeling bereft. Go. Go with him into that privacy. So here he is, feeling miserable, feeling low, wanting to gather the 12, get into their celebrations as well. And he's in this quiet place. But we told the crowds follow him. And suddenly he is now confronted once again by too many people around him, pressing in on him. What does he do? Does he tell them, go away, <laughs> make an appointment with the secretary, go to hell, man, I'm tired of you people. Does he say, come back tomorrow when I'm feeling better? No, he has compassion on them. You know, when Paul had a terrible time, he writes of it in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, that he, he, he felt things were going horribly wrong in all sorts of ways, persecution, shipwreck, pain, being lashed, punished. Uh, and he said it felt like a death sentence had been passed on him. Uh, he writes, but our God is the father of all compassion and the God of all comfort. And, and that little passage in 2 Corinthians ends with Paul saying, he, he has comforted us. He will comfort us. He will continue to comfort us. How far does Jesus go in showing his compassion to us? and for us. Well, all the way to the grave. We were dead in our sins when he came to save us. <laughs> and dear friends, when we are dead, do it dead, gefrek, cold, unable to help ourselves at all, the good shepherd will come again. And just as he did with Jairus' daughter, raise us to life, just as he did for the son of the widow of Nain, raise us to life, just as he did with his friend Lazarus, just as he promises the thief on the cross, to, to this very day you will be with me in paradise. So he's there with us. And I believe all this, man. <laughs> I just simply believe that he's interested in me, ups and downs, that he'll carry me through these difficult sheep without shepherd moments, and even through death. We sometimes sing in some churches a song that says, you are here moving in this place. You are here working in this place. You're the way maker, you're the miracle worker, you're light in the darkness, you're the promise keeper. You're here turning lives around. Quickly, before I end, this word compassion. The two words in the New Testament Greek that we could translate compassion. Uh, the, the one is symponia. Obviously, you can see the word sympathy comes from it, to, to have sympathy for someone, to, to, in a sense, feel what they're feeling or try to feel what they're feeling. But there's, there's another much more explosive, dramatic word that's used uh, of the compassion of Jesus and his use of him alone. And the word is splunkhinsomai. Splunkhinsomai. Now, in medical terminology, your splunkha and your splunkha nerve is, is, is what connects all your, all your internal organs, all this visceral stuff right here. And when, when Jesus has compassion, we're told that he has this splunkhinsomai. Literally, he has compassion in his very guts, you know. Uh, Paul once talks about the bowels of Christ's love, just the, 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 the deep inner feeling of God's kindness, compassion for us. So that's what he feels. Sheep without shepherd, he sees it, he feels it. And then it says, and he healed their sick. 
we are encouraged, beloveds, that when we're not well, to go to our ministers and elders and ask for the laying on of hands and for prayer, with or without anointing. Please do that. If you're not well, nag Tony, nag for an appointment. Whoever you are listening to this, wherever you are, nag the elders of your church. Hang on, I went to her funeral last, last Saturday. A beautiful woman, 93 years old, absolute saint of God in her church, the O Apostolica Kirk. She had led so many people to the Lord, her whole family. She used to play guitar, she would sing songs. Just a beautiful woman. The church leaders in that, in that denomination are called priests. There were two of them to lead the service. Both of them were baptized in lemon juice. I've never seen more miserable so-and-sos in my life. Not a smile, not a word of encouragement. They chose the most obscure texts. They lectured the congregation. They tried to convince us that we were angels and we should be doing angelic work. It, 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 it was so bad that the family came to see me the next day to ask, what, what, what was that funeral all about? And when the eldest son got up to sing a, a song about the love of Jesus and just brought warmth and joy into, into the whole congregation, the only time in the service, the two priests stood there with their face down, looking as miserable as hell itself. And I wondered, when last did they themselves ask for the laying of, on of hands and to be encouraged, or when last did they go to a quiet place? Sorry to make the comparison, but it was so obvious that some could celebrate the resurrection, having been comforted by Jesus, and some portrayed something that was dark and, and sad. So, final, final, final which we've all known in this passage, the, the fish and the loaves are presented to Jesus. Whether they come from a little boy or not, somehow the disciples say, we've got this little bit of food to share with all these people. And of course, Jesus uses it. What's there to learn about that? He respects us. He respects us and he uses us. Our God is not just interested in us, but he's made us useful and he wants to use us. He's, we're not pawns, we're not useless, we're not worms on the end of a, of, of, of a stick, we're not ugly. We, we are gifted by God for his work and to bless his church and others. So, elders, take your job seriously. Go and pray with the sick. Ministers, take your job seriously. Preach the good news and invite people to come and be close to Jesus. I'm in the Lord's army. I'm a co-worker of Christ Jesus. I'm not useless. I'm not ugly. I'm not stupid. I'm not silly. I'm not dumb. Although I can feel it often. But our God is a God of compassion. And he invites me to come be quiet with him. Pour my guts out to him. Whether it's good news and I'm deliriously happy that somehow I've done something well for him and for my family or whether I'm just having a sheep without a shepherd period in my life. I hope you've learned nothing new today. I hope you all go home saying, wow, I feel content, warm. I've reheard what I've always known and I'm confirmed again in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the friendship of the Spirit. God bless you all and thanks for listening.